Welcome back, everyone. It's Maximus. My fellow comrades, I bring you the beautiful SU-25 Frogfoot. I'm just kidding, guys. I'm not going to do this video in a Russian accent or a pathetic attempt at a Russian accent. However, it would have been quite fitting for this aircraft today. Welcome, everyone. It's Maximus. I appreciate you stopping by on today's video. We are discussing military aviation once again, and this time we're returning to the world of Russia. Now, as many of you are well aware, I have a very strong passion for the A-10 Thunderbolt slash Warhawk. Absolutely beautiful aircraft. Unfortunately, though, it seems to be around most of the Western world that we tend to get very blindsided by the fact that the A-10 is this amazing aircraft and it has that obviously very powerful gun that is the staple of its firepower. Uh, but you've got to remember there are other aircraft out there other than the A-10 that can provide some very good close air support and air to ground uh, firepower. Today guys we are talking about the Russian Su-25 Frogfoot and what an impressive aircraft this is. Now I used to play a lot of video games that were involving the Cold War and this again was one of those aircraft in a game uh, because I am a gaming channel too guys let's be honest here uh, that I was always kind of fearful of and I saw a lot of movies with the Su-25 and I was like wow that's a pretty cool jet uh, but it doesn't look like it could do much. Wow how I was wrong. This aircraft can do so much more than you think it can. It is very, very um, underrated, I find. It's also one of those aircraft you really don't want to judge a book by its cover. And when I look at this aircraft, I really don't see anything special popping out. It's until you actually do some research and start looking into the capabilities of this aircraft, you start to think, hmm, actually, this thing is pretty badass. So guys, as always, when my videos go through in their template, I'm going to discuss its specifications, its history, and then finally my input slash opinion on this aircraft overall. So, the Su-25 is a multi-role, twin-engine attack fighter for close air support. This type of aircraft is called Shtumovic in Russian, and is basically designed as a tank killer. It was developed in the 1960s. The Su-25 is designed for high-precision destruction of all ground targets in all weather conditions by day or night. Primarily, it's designed to destroy tanks. However, it can also go for bridges, means of transport, firing positions, commander control elements, convoys, motorways, railways, combat helicopters, etc, etc. Overall, this aircraft is pretty much designed to annihilate anything on the ground and potentially at sea too. So due to its combat capabilities, its resistance to fire, its striking power and efficiency make it quite comparable to the A-10 Thunderbolt. However, of course, not the same. Its structure, its universal electronic equipment, and especially its wide range of multi-purpose weaponry make it very applicable to nearly all demanding conditions out there for close air support of ground units in the Russian armed forces and elsewhere in the globe. Sukhoi really know how to design aircraft, and the Sukhoi Design Bureau started work to produce this aircraft in 1968. It is old school. The new plane was meant for support of troops from directly over the battlefield and designed to be extremely easy to use and maintain as a subsonic jet aircraft with superior maneuverability and damage control if engaged from the ground. Overall, the Russian military wanted something that could get low and get fast and engage targets and potentially take a bit of a hit too. In the period of 1970 to 1971, the Su-25 design project was entered for an attack aircraft pilot design competition along with projects by the other design bureaus. The conceptual design and mock-up were reviewed in September 1972, and the prototype T-81 completed in November 1974. It was taken up for its maiden flight by Design Bureau's chief pilot V.S. Ilishin on the 22nd of February 1975. The Bureau's testing of two Su-25 prototype planes went on until October 1976, with the aircraft subsequently returned for engineering follow-up. Official testing of the aeroplane started in 1978. It was decided to combine the first stage of the Su-25's governmental testing with the plane's trials under the Army's field conditions in Afghanistan. A joint task force was formed of the Air Force's R&D Institute test team and representatives of the industry, which was given, in addition to seconded technical personnel, two prototype planes, the T-81D and the T-83. Between the 16th of April and the 5th of June 1980, the Shindand airfield in the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan saw the task force arrange 100 test flights, including 44 actual tactical missions. Talk about testing this thing. In course of testing, the Su-25 demonstrated a very good combat performance. The governmental testing was completed in December 1980. The Su-25 was produced at a plant in Tbilisi, and the first production plane tested on the 18th of June 1979 by the Design Bureau's test pilot Yuri Yergrov. 
Over the period of its series production, the aircraft underwent large-scale re-engineering. In 1984, it saw a special export variant developed, which was called the Su-25K, or the T-8K, and supplied to Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, Iraq, and <laughs> the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, and to Angola. Following the battlefield testing in Afghanistan, the plane underwent huge redesign in 1987-88 to improve its damage control. It passed its trials in 1989-1990 and was put into series production as an Su-25 version with the new R-195 engine. A batch of Su-25BM target towing aircraft were also produced in 1991. After 1991, Su-25 planes were decommissioned from the air forces of Belarus and Russia were exported to Peru and Ethiopia. A distinctive feature of the Su-25 as an attack aircraft designed for close battlefield support missions in an asset populated environment is its improved damage control. With the extensive re-engineering that was carried out on the plane, it received a massive armoured cockpit. It was also given foam-filled, reinforced, explosion-proof fuel tanks, which is obviously quite important if you're getting shot at from the sky, among many other features. Prior to incorporation of the plane, these features were bench-tested by the design bureau to subsequently validate if their plane's operation was actually good against hostilities in Afghanistan. They made sure if they're going to send these things into combat, that they're actually going to work effectively, and if Afghanistan's not the best battleground testing for being shot at from the floor, I don't know what else is. The USSR Air Forces entered the Su-25 into service as part of the inventory of a separate attack aircraft regiment known as the SAAR under District Army Command. The first 11 production planes were assigned in April 1981 to 80 SAARs stationed at the Satel Shai Airfield. The resources of the regiment were used to put together the 200th Separate Attack Aircraft Squadron, or SAAS, not the SAS that you're thinking of, which was deployed in June 1981 as part of the Air Force's 40th Army in Afghanistan to become the first combat of USSR Air Forces to fly missions of the Su-25 attack aircraft. Throughout the subsequent entire period of the Soviet troops' engagement in Afghanistan, the Su-25 was a key asset of air support to troops on the battlefield. The Su-25 aircraft demonstrated very good combat performance and damage control, and the hostilities that the airplane saw some 60,000 plus combat hours and missions, with a mere 23 planes lost in total as a result of battle damage in the air. Now I say mere 23 planes, but when you think of the size of the force that they sent to Afghanistan and the number of sorties that these aircraft flew, and the type of environment they're in, overall it's not too bad. The average incurred flying time of the plane was around 2,600 hours, which is significantly higher than showing for any other combat aircraft used in Afghanistan. The Su-25 was officially put into service by a decree of the government on the 31st of March 1987. By that time, the aeroplane had already been in a series of production for around 8 years, six of which had been spent in complete active service testing the aircraft including the combat missions in Afghanistan that weren't even tests, but designated as true combat missions. As part of Russia's Air Force infantry, the Su-25 planes have been used since 1994 in combat operations against insurgents in the Chechen Republic. Abroad, Su-25Ks were extensively used in combat operations by the Iraqi Air Force in 1981-88, also against the war in Iran, by the Angola's Air Force during the 80s and 90s Civil War. In August 1988, there was a mass-produced Su-25UB, which was used by the Design Bureau as a platform for the Su-25UTG two-seat trainer version for naval aviators of aircraft carrier-based planes. There are two versions of the aircraft with almost identical parameters, the single-seat Su-25K and the two-seat Su-25UBK, which is used for training pilots of this type while keeping all the advantages of the single-seat modification and all the capabilities of a combat application. Standard equipment on the aircraft is an internal 30mm AO-17 Alpha gun with 250 rounds. Other optional weaponry includes pods of 57mm up to 330mm rockets and a number of air-to-surface missiles including the CH-23, otherwise known as the AS-7 Kerry, the CH-25, otherwise known as the AS-10 Karen, and the CH-29, otherwise known as the AS-14 Kedge. A built-in laser target illuminator is on the nose and permits homing of air-to-surface missiles. There's a sliding and cluster bombs munition being able to be put on board and multi-purpose laser guided weaponry. For longer distances, a laser target illuminator can be mounted in a pod under the wing. 
The R-60 AA-8 AFID, or air-to-air -air missile, provides self-defense against enemy aircraft at short range. For ground target complete destruction, it can be fitted additionally with an SPPU-22 machine gun. The SU-25 can take off and land with armament, loading fully on limited runways without reinforced services. This allows it to get in and out of hotspots without having to worry about landing on heavy runways. In mountainous regions at an altitude of around 3,000 meters above sea level, takeoff and landing runways of 1,200 meters are sufficient to permit its operation. This makes it possible to reduce the distance from the theater of operation, frequently changing the takeoff sites and conducting surprise attacks against enemy ground targets. There is an increasing demand for an all-weather night capable SU-25 with increased range endurance and survivability which led to the development of the SU-25T. This was based on the airframe of the SU-25UB two-seat trainer version with a humped rear cockpit fared over. Unusually, the TM carries its Kapoi 25 radar externally in a pod underneath the fuselage. The 20 Georgian built SU-25Ts have been upgraded to the Yulan Yud 25TMs and the SU-25UBs are similarly being upgraded to the SU-25UBMs. The Russian Air Force currently operates about 250 SU-25s and is upgrading 80 of them to be SU-25SM standards using the systems developed from the SU-25TMs. These will have nose-mounted Kopioi radars and the SU-25SM M3 GRAC is the latest version. The aircraft's cockpit is quite impressive, similar to that of the A-10. The aircraft has an all-welded 24mm titanium alloy cockpit with a transparent windscreen armour block to protect the pilot. It is also equipped with a single K36L Sveda ejection seat which allows the pilots to pop out of there if things get a little scary. <laughs> the wings have 10 pylons for carrying a range of air-to-air -air and air-to-ground systems. As already mentioned, there's multiple different missiles that can be placed on there. It can be fitted with UB-32 Alpha pods for the 57mm S5 rockets and the B-8M1 pods for the 80mm S8 rockets also. It can also be given the S-24 240mm guided rockets and the S-25 330mm guided rockets. The aircraft is equipped with an integrated navigation and aiming system including the ASP-17 BT's 8 gun bomb sight with an AKS-750S camera installed on the nose. The nose also houses a Klylon PS laser range and target designator manufactured by Ural's optical and mechanical plant. The electronic warfare suite includes the SPO-15 Serena 3 radar warning receiver and the Gardena radar jammer. The ASO-2V decoy dispenser can deploy chaff and flares for protection against radar and infrared guided missiles, which of course are going to be very apparent for an aircraft flying so low and not particularly fast. The aircraft is equipped with a RSBN tactical air navigation system known as TACAN. It is an MRP-56P marker beacon receiving unit. The RV-1S radio altimeter and various air data acceleration indicators are allowing the aircraft to take as much navigation and communications as possible. The engines are pretty damn impressive on this aircraft. The Russian Air Force Su-25 aircrafts are powered by the two Soyuz Garilov R-195S turbojet engines rated at 44.18 kN per engine. The cooling air is introduced at the end of the tail cone to reduce temperature of the exhaust gases and minimize the infrared signature of the aircraft from those nasty heat-seeking missiles from the ground. The aircraft is equipped with a self-sealing foam-filled fuel tank which is imperative to an aircraft of this type with a total fuel capacity of around 3,600 litres. The range of the aircraft can be extended by the provision of four PTB-1500 external fuel tanks which are carried on the underwig pylons. The SC-25 can climb at a rate of 58 metres a second and the maximum speed of the aircraft is 950 kilometres an hour. The combat radius and ferry range of the aircraft is around around 375 km and 7500 km respectively. The normal range of the SU-25 though is 750 km and its surface ceiling is around 7000 m. The takeoff and landing roll of the SU-25 are 750 m and 600 m respectively. The aircraft weighs around 10740 kg and its maximum takeoff weight is 17600 kg which is a lot of weight for this aircraft to be hauling from the ground which makes it ideal for putting down as much munitions onto the ground that it needs to do. That's its primary role, engaging anything and everything on the ground. So, what do I think of the beautiful Su-25 and its variants? Well, overall, it's a very capable close air support aircraft. It can clearly provide a lot of firepower when needed. The number of pylons this aircraft has and the kind of firepower it can carry 
really does say to me, holy cow, like if you're going to drop this kind of payload onto a position, they're going to have a really bad day. A couple of things that kind of stand out for me that kind of make me second guess myself. The aircraft is using very old technology. Yes, I know some of the missiles that it's using, both you know air to air and air to ground, are still quite capable. But when you look at some of the more modern day technology that's coming out there, like Brimstone and the Hellfire upgraded packages, we're not seeing the kind of electronics and the targeting systems uh, that we're seeing in some of the Western aircraft coming onto this aircraft. And I don't know if that's because I can't find any of that information. I'm sure there are more modern day weapon systems they're placing onto these aircraft, but I couldn't really find too much that integrated into this aircraft's day-to-day uh, -day use. It seems as though the Russian Air Force and the Russian military are more focused on using, um, you know, their helicopter power, the Ka-52 and the Heinz and such, to provide that close air support than they are with these aircraft. That being said, this aircraft has an exemplary, um, you know, match when it comes to conventional warfare. I mean, really, when it's dropping, you know, dumb bombs and dumb rockets and munitions such as cannon, it's really ticking every single box in providing close air support. Yes, it's not the rotary Gatling gun that you see underneath the beautiful A-10, but to be honest, guys, it doesn't have to be that huge cannon to provide such firepower. This aircraft is relying more heavily on um, rocket pods, and we know that with Russian doctrine. They like to use their rockets. They rocket everything from... Uh, the rocket pods on the hind to the rocket pods on this they love their rockets and of course the u.s military uh, hasn't really decided as much towards rockets than they have using more high-tech munitions and uh, accurate guns like the apache gunship using its 30 millimeter cannon all that good stuff the russians tend to like the shoot and scoot maneuver with the rockets you know dropping as many rockets as they can on the position flying back out of there unfortunately due to times changing it's really not as applicable especially when it comes to friendly fire. We want to be able to utilize cannons and, and missiles that are very, very accurate. That's kind of funny that I say that, though, because the A-10 really isn't ticking that box when it comes to that gigantic rotary cannon. Uh, you know, those rounds coming onto the ground, I've seen them in action being deployed in Afghanistan. There is nothing about that aircraft that just really says accuracy uh, and potential misfire to friendly fire is... Uh, still apparent on that aircraft so we can't really say oh well yeah but the a10 is more accurate eh, no <laughs> that's just not the case uh overall though this aircraft really does very well at ticking every box when it comes to close air support and that's its role that's what it was designed to do i honestly think though russia really needs to start developing a lot more modernized uh, aircraft for this particular role but do they though that's the thing this is a, an argument that I've had for quite some time with many people online as to why we're developing such high-tech weaponry for a war we're never going to fight. If you look at the reality of the world when it comes to actual conflicts that are taking place, this aircraft is perfect for it. It is not a super expensive aircraft. It does everything that is needed to in terms of conventional warfare, which ideally is what we're looking at right now. We're talking about taking on insurgents, um, at uh, very low level technology and threat levels slash ratios. So being able to just send a few of these aircraft in and drop as much dumb munitions as they can onto a position and not have to worry too much about counter-attack, it's perfect. It doesn't need to be taking on, you know, Patriot missile systems and F-15s chasing it and F-22s looking at it for it and, you know, Stinger missiles. Yes, of course, there's still going to be that ground-to-air threat, but I don't feel like Russia really has to worry so much about you know more high-tech technology looking after this aircraft in the sky i think this aircraft still has a little bit of surface light left in it in the you know kind of conflicts we're looking into nowadays but overall it is time i think for it to part its way and russia needs to really develop a more modernized platform uh, for this role guys i hope you enjoyed today's video please leave me a comment let me know what you thought of it let me know what you think of the aircraft too if uh, any of you've had any experiences with it i'd love to hear and no that doesn't mean on dcs <laughs> i've played dcs as the Frogfoot, and i didn't do very well feel free to go check that video out um and leave me a like if you didn't enjoy the video i really appreciate also guys if you want to support my channel to go check out my patreon account it would really mean a lot to me as always with military content for the most part it tends to get demonetized so your support to my channel has been most appreciated in the past and i really really respect every single one of you that have donated towards my channel so thank you so so much um, and uh, hopefully in the future i'll be able to provide you plenty more content guys have a wonderful day and i'll see you next time for more military related videos bye bye